All right, without further ado, welcome to our webinar today on sick building syndrome. If you are watching our webinar live, there is a Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen where you can post any questions which I will answer at the end. Our details will also be on a follow-up email sent by our sales manager, Chrissy, which will include a link to the recording of today's session and some online resources. To kick off, let's start with a few uh, questions just as a foundation. Um, so with sick building syndrome, it always comes to mind of a colleague that has always been cheery and friendly and excited. And then after some time spending in an office environment or in a building, they become grumpy, irritable, or yawning frequently. Ever notice students nodding off in the middle of a lecture, mostly from their late night studying, but it could also be due to a buildup of carbon dioxide in a lecture hall, sick building syndrome. If you have itchy eyes, a runny nose, or constant sneezing while feeling unable to concentrate, this could be sick building syndrome. The reason is most likely poor indoor air quality, which could result in the sick building syndrome if it's left unchecked. The term sick building syndrome describes the occurrence of building occupants experiencing discomfort and acute ill health. The occurrences appear to be related to time spent in a specific building, but no specific illness or cause is identified. Occurrences can be related to a particular room or area, or could be throughout the whole building. Sick building syndrome is not to be confused with building related illness which is a diagnosable illness or disease and can be identified and attributable to airborne contaminants within a building. Often buildings that are renovated or the original design or use have changed, such as if there were single offices that has been changed into open plan offices, um, they may they not have sufficient ventilation for this newly increased occupation or occupancy. Uh, poor building design can also be one of the root causes for sick building syndrome, as there is no fresh air supply into the areas. And uh, if there is fresh air supply, but there is no return air grills, positive air pressure could also be the leading cause for the amount of fresh air not being sufficient for those occupied spaces. Occupant activities such as increased printing stages with insufficient amount of air changes or not having return air grills could also lead to poor indoor air quality because there's not enough fresh air coming into the area. So sick building syndrome is often related with a reduced work air efficiency, increased absenteeism, people taking more sick leave. Symptoms include result headaches, dizziness, nausea, eye, nose and throat irritation, coughing, dry skin, difficulty concentrating, fatigue, sensitivity, if there's any odors, or hoarseness of their voice when they enter the building or they've been in there for a while, uh, increase of allergies, cold and flu-like symptoms, increased asthma attacks, and normally when people leave the building, their symptoms dissipate and we come back again once they enter into either the office environment or the building that they relate these symptoms with. In 1984, the World Health Organization suggested that about 30% of newer remodeled buildings worldwide are affected. 1984 is quite some time ago, and yet still we see symptoms and uh, increased absenteeism related to sick building syndrome. We also see an increase in the awareness going out and people asking for advice on how to actually deal with the sick building syndrome and make it better for the employees working within these environments. Just as a recap, uh, sick building syndrome is related to the building use when it's different from the original purpose, poor building design when there hasn't been any fresh air going into certain office spaces, as well as occupant activities, which can be related to printing, cleaning, cutting off papers, so let's delve into sick building syndrome and what this actually means. First, we'll start off with where sick building syndrome is most likely to occur. 
So we find sick building syndrome in office cubicles, open plan offices, hospital reception areas, classrooms, lecture halls, factory floors, call centers, control rooms for uh, production facilities and manufacturing areas where employees are situated and monitoring the processes that they are running, as well as laboratories. So in conclusion for sick building syndrome and where this can occur, any occupied space that people are in for a prolonged period of times can be affected by sick building syndrome if the parameters are not kept in check. Who is affected by sick building syndrome? People who are sensitive, immunocompromised, young children and elderly persons. And why are they more prone to being affected by sick building syndrome? Well, immunocompromised individuals have underlying illnesses, for example, such as heart disease, diabetes, HIV and AIDS, cancer, and their immune system is not strong enough to deal with daily irritations, and therefore they would be more affected by sick building syndrome than your healthy individuals. Young children is also easily affected by any changes within their environment, and their immune system is still developing. So they are easily affected because their immune system hasn't learned yet how to deal with irritations in their environment. Elderly people are affected by sick building syndrome because their immune system is not as strong as it used to be, and therefore they are easily more affected by irritants within their workspace. It's also important to note that people who are allergic uh, to pollens or dusts or any sensitization from chemicals could also affect people more easily within the working environment. Signs of sick building syndrome. Signs, as we've discussed previously, a little less in detail, could be asthma attacks for people that are sensitive to dust or have allergies, increased irritability. When you constantly have an itchy throat, you tend to be slightly more irritable, or if you can't focus the way you would like and you have a deadline looming, this could also affect your irritability levels. If you're constantly tired, but you've been Excited to get to work and once you enter into the building after a few hours, you get tired, you get fatigued because you're not getting enough oxygen in. You feel uncomfortable, there's a stuffiness in the air, but you just can't put your finger on where it's coming from. And a general lack of motivation because no one wants to spend time in an area that they are not comfortable in, that they constantly feel tired in or where they constantly are exposed to irritation within the environment. The health effects from sick building syndrome could also be very closely related to some of the symptoms. And these include allergies, asthma, respiratory irritation, chemical sensitization or irritation from being sensitized to certain chemicals. Chronic fatigue syndrome, being constantly tired when you enter into, into a building. It's important to note that the symptoms go away after leaving a specific building or area. Sensitized individuals may have <clears throat> the reverse effect after long years of exposure and may exhibit symptoms upon leaving the affected building or area. Symptoms associated with sick building syndrome can be broken into three categories. These include general symptoms, which is headaches, nausea, dizziness, hoarseness, allergies, flu-like symptoms, respiratory diseases, fatigue, and an inability to concentrate. Secondly, we have the mucous membrane symptoms, which would be your eyes, nose, and throat irritation, constant coughing for no evident reason. So you're not sick, you don't have flu, but you're just irritated the whole time. Your eyes are watery or scratchy. Your nose is itchy. You might be sneezing frequently. And thirdly, we have the cutaneous system, which is our skin. So with sick building syndrome, this could also be related to dry skin, itchy skin, skin on your face being itchy or cracked, hands and scalp irritation because of dryness. And this all results in significant healthcare expenses and an increased sick leave within the workforce, which leads to a loss of productivity. So what is the culprit? Who, what's causing sick building syndrome? 
So sick building, sick building syndrome is caused by poor ventilation design, where there's no fresh air or there's not enough fresh air, where there's too high relative humidity or not enough relative humidity, which is also your water vapor within your indoor environment. There's no means to regulate the temperature. There's no, you can't control if you're getting cold to increase temperature or when it's too hot to have some means of reducing the temperature like with an aircon. There's a stagnant airflow, there's no air movement, everything feels stuffy. If there's a carbon dioxide buildup, this also leads into fatigue because your body isn't getting fresh air. And this is related to if there is a supply of fresh air, but there's no means uh, of that used air to be extracted through return air grills, or there's no windows that can be opened, meaning that there is no fresh air being supplied, especially if there's no ducted air with that. Um, that could all lead to a buildup of carbon dioxide. In call centers, for example, where there's a lot of people within one open plan office, often the system isn't designed for the amount of people within that area. So that leads to a buildup of carbon dioxide. Additional to that, it could also be that occupants have exceeded the ventilation numbers. Uh, pollutants such as particles, if you have a lot of shredding going on with papers that could also be producing uh, paper dust into the facility, volatile organic compounds from newly renovated areas such as carpets or the facility has just been painted or a new division of offices has been installed and everyone just continues working. All of that paint basically off gases out of the wall and into the environment where people are sitting working for more than eight hours a day. Formaldehyde is associated with newly uh, bought furniture. If there's any new furniture placed into an office environment or a work environment or an environment like a lecture hall where people are sitting for prolonged periods of time, formaldehyde generally off gases out of wood furniture and that will go into the indoor environment. Dampness is also related with fungi which could be growing in either the ventilation ducts of a building or within the walls, surface spaces of lecture halls or offices. And these spores of the fungi or the mold could also lead to irritation and they might not always be visible. Chemicals in the air from cleaning products, pesticides after having uh, pesticides sprayed in an area, they still off gas for quite some time and might be related to some of the signs or symptoms that people might be experiencing when entering those areas. Ozone may also be present within office environments or lecture halls, anywhere where there's printers and fax machines used. Insect and animal droppings could also be related to mold and fungi as, and bacteria, and this could also lead to irritation as well as illnesses and tobacco smoke from either outside areas where it comes into the indoor environment or people may be smoking in the bathrooms, which they shouldn't be doing. And that could lead to irritation for the people within that vicinity. If we move further into the culprits, there's a few examples of where all of these different chemicals can be from within your indoor environments. It could be from if you have a salon, all of the makeup, all of the chemicals used for dyeing hair, these could all lead to a bit of irritation for the staff working in that vicinity or neighboring office environments or neighboring uh, shops, which could be exposed to these chemicals going out of this indoor environment into their environment. These are all related to poor design of ventilation systems, no fresh outside air, too high or low relative humidity. If new carpets have been installed, there's an off-gassing of different chemicals like the paint and the wood furniture with formaldehyde. If there's a roadway or a road close by, then your ambient environment may also be contaminated with carbon monoxide. And this could come into your working environment if you have a supply of fresh air ventilation system, the carbon monoxide can't be filtered out and that could then be being pushed in through that system into your indoor environment without your employees being aware 
or if there is a warehouse next door to certain of your office areas and there is LPG gas uh, forklifts being used, carbon monoxide may be building up and being moved into an office environment where the employees are sitting for more than eight hours or eight hours a day being exposed to carbon monoxide. So if they start being irritable, feeling a bit fatigued, it might be either carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide being built up and sick building syndrome being present. Just to recap, activities that could affect the indoor air quality is newly renovated indoor areas, volatile organic compounds from new carpets or painting, formaldehyde from new office furniture, dust residue from construction activities, chemicals from cleaning products, pollutions from printing or copier machines, outdoor contamination, and dust buildup due to poor housekeeping. If we look into microorganisms, the fungi, the mold, the bacteria, viruses, pollen, plant and animal debris, these are either particles or droplets or spores. Oftentimes they are not visible to the naked eye because they are so small or they might be within an enclosed area such as the ventilation ducting system or between the panels within walls or in carpets where there has been uh, water damage or ceiling panels where there's been water damage and it's been painted over but the damaged panels hasn't been refurbished. So these are all the sources of where they might be from. It's also notable to, to be aware that what is a viable and a non-viable culture, if we speak about these type of uh, bacteria and microorganisms, a viable culture is something that can be reproduced in a laboratory. So it is something that is alive. A non-viable or non-culturable uh, specimen cannot be reproduced. So these are often your pollens, your dusts, something that isn't alive and cannot be reproduced within a laboratory setting. How can we control these types of substances and toxins or live growing organisms? So good housekeeping, keeping your relative humidity levels in check, rectifying any water damage. If there has been water damage, rather remove the panels and get them refurbished with ones that have not been exposed to water. Frequent uh, maintenance of the ventilation system, such as the ducting with biocide, so that there's no mold or bacteria growth within these systems that actually supposed to bring in the fresh air. As well as if there is irritation, there could be a biological mold or spore monitoring conducted. And we do those through uh, spore trapping, or we have uh, gelatin agar sample cassettes that we draw air through and we could actually then see what organisms are growing within this indoor environment. So what do we do with this information? It is important to note that some aspects are not visible as we explained before like mold and this can be growing in areas where we cannot see them even if there was a visible water damage and it has now been removed, we would not necessarily be able to tell. Outside air conditions could also affect the indoor air quality if it's not filtered properly, and this could result in indoor contamination. Fresh air units may be provided, but if they're not switched on, they would not help regulate indoor air conditions. This is often the case when people are not in control of controlling the temperature within the indoor environments, they would switch off the aircon facility or the ventilation system because they feel that the air coming in is either too cold or too hot and the air movement flowing through is not comfortable for these individuals. And there's also no other means of controlling this parameter within this indoor environment. And they switch off the system carbon dioxide starts building up, there's no fresh air coming in, people start getting fatigued, they start getting irritable, and this is all leading to sick bouldering syndrome. Similarly, where there's fresh air supply diffuses and the airflow changes, it's important that it's balanced with the number of people within that environment. So whenever there's a bit of irritation, people are feeling fatigued quite often within their environment, 
especially in the office system, or they keep sneezing whenever entering the building, or they, their eyes and their skin is irritable. These are signs that there is something of the parameters for this ventilation that is not as it should be. So how do we prevent sick building syndrome? Routine and maintenance checks. So ventilation surveys where we can check the parameters. Chem safety can assist with this. And this means that we will come in, we will inspect the ventilation system. We will see what systems are in place. Can any of the individuals within their environments control these parameters? Is there a means for them to increase or decrease temperature? Is there a way for them to have more or less airflow within the system? And we take measurements within each and every office as well, if it's not the same type of ventilation system that's installed in this vicinity. We look at the airflow, we look at the relative humidity, we look at the carbon monoxide levels, the carbon dioxide levels, and the temperature. And then we compare all of these measurements with standard ranges from ASHRA, as well as other guidance documents, to see where is the problem lying and how do we fix it. Routine maintenance checks also make sure that your ventilation means, the, the ventilation system that's been installed or your air conditioning system, that these all work properly and that they have the correct balance between air coming in and air being extracted, that this system is capable of heating and cooling your indoor spaces, as well as controlling the amount of relative humidity within your environment. Again, what does this all mean? So indoor air quality increases your occupation health and wellness because your employees are comfortable within their office environments, within their working spaces. They have sufficient amount of oxygen in order to do all of the work that's required of them. They're comfortable in their work areas. They don't have any itchy skin. They don't feel too cold to do their work. They're not too hot to do their work. The environment is not too stuffy in order to feel like they can't breathe. So all of these parameters lead to a productivity increase because your employees are happy within the environment where they're working when your indoor air quality is balanced and within the right parameters. They also have less sick leave due to ventilation related complaints because if your indoor air quality is of a good quality and there isn't any of the parameters that are out of range, then your employees would not want to stay away from the office necessarily due to any of the indoor air quality reasons because they don't have any itchy skin, they're not irritable, they're not constantly sneezing, they don't feel tired and fatigued because you've taken care of your indoor air quality for the building. If we look into a little bit of what all plays a part, we look at your ventilation systems. So if there's fresh outside air being supplied into an environment, this is normally best achieved with the HBLS fans, which is your high volume, low speed fans. And they bring in filtered, hopefully, fresh air from the outside environment. If it's not filtered fresh air, then normally there is a bit of contaminants and dust coming in from outside. In most cases, these systems are filtered. So that is filtered fresh air being brought in. And the high volume, low speed systems are the better ones because they are more uh, capable of bringing in a lot of air at a time while using less energy, less electricity in order to do so. Air handling units such as these fans alone could also result in stagnant air because there's no return, return air growth. So that means that the air has nowhere to go. It's being pushed in, but it can't go anywhere. So with that, it just sits there and it doesn't actually move. So that can still lead to a buildup of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, any of the indoor air pollutants cannot go anywhere because this air is basically trapped. And we look at uh, HVAC system. These are your heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, which could also be coupled with your air handling units to bring in fresh air. Um, so your heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system is a system that is used to control the relative humidity. It's used to bring uh, your temperature higher or lower in order to have comfort levels for your occupants within the environment. If they are not coupled with air handling units, then they are not capable 
of bringing down carbon dioxide. They are not capable of bringing in fresh air. And they are basically then just used for temperature control and relative humidity control when they are not coupled. It's also important that you know which type of system you have within your working environment so that you know what the system is capable of doing. And if there is any additional type of system or means that needs to be provided to your employees in order to be healthy and in order to be comfortable within your, within your working environment. If you know what system you have and your employees have been provided with all of the necessary means in, to control all of these parameters within their workplaces, it's important to train them on how to use these systems properly, on what parameters these systems need to be set at in order to prevent sick building syndrome and keep them healthy and happy within their working environments. As an example, <clears throat> just to explain a little bit better how the airflow works, especially when it is provided air systems. So we'll see here outside air comes in. We'll look at the best case scenario for design. Outside air comes in, it moves through the area and it gets extracted through a return air flow back into the environment. Some of the other type of systems that you might have come across and might notice going forward is you'll see air coming in through many different air diffusers within the ceiling environment. And there's some way in the room there is a little grill that also extracts the air. So the air will be pushed in and extracted out of this system. It could also be that the system was designed for less heat, so there will only be one pan-type diffuser or a supply air diffuser, pushing fresh air into your environment and extracting it somewhere in the ceiling out into the outside environment again. Uh, the systems sometimes get short-circuited, so your supply air diffuser is too close, your return air grill, and the air doesn't actually move through the area, but just goes right into the return air grill, and the rest of the system is left with carbon dioxide buildup contamination buildup, stagnant air pressures within this area where the air hasn't flown into and poor temperature control if there hasn't been any other means here. So those are just examples of what you can find and what supply air systems would look like. If we look at the parameters that's important for good indoor air quality, we normally reference AFRA standard 6.2.1 of 2019, and there's also ASHRAE standard uh, 55, um, which is used for your relative humidity and temperature requirements. So if we look at ASHRAE, we'll see there is standard parameters for linear air velocity, your airspeed or airflow, carbon dioxide levels, carbon monoxide levels are normally related with your ambient air, and ASHRAE also speaks about these a little bit. Your relative humidity is recommended at 30 to 65%. Anything lower than that leads to static. Anything higher than that leads to mold growth and uncomfortable stuffiness. Your temperature parameters are related to the amount of activity that is conducted within an indoor environment. Um, so you can't just have a standard of, for example, 25 degrees Celsius if people are working quite hard physically because their bodies will be producing energy and producing heat as well. So all of these types of factors needs to be considered for good indoor air quality. And your particulate matter as a good standard should be below your ambient, national ambient ranges as well. Um, and this is because some people within indoor spaces might have compromised immunity, might be more sensitive two different types of chemicals might have asthma, might have allergies. So even if this is lower than the waste, the workplace exposure standard, this is the reason why. It's because there are people out there that are compromised, that are not uh, equipped to deal with those type of levels. So it's best to be lower for indoor air quality in order to uh, also think about the staff of individuals who might be within indoor spaces. If we look at benzene and formaldehyde, these are particularly important as they are also indoor air pollutants, which are very frequently seen within the indoor environments. Benzene 
is a chemical that decreases white blood cell counts. It is genotoxic and carcinogenic. And the short-term exposure to high levels of benzene can cause drowsiness, dizziness, headaches, and unconsciousness. So benzene's national ambient standard is at 3.6 micrograms per cubic meter. Anything more than that within an indoor environment where people are day-to-day -day exposed for more than eight hours will start leading to irritability. And this is not a good chemical to have within your system. Formaldehyde is also, if there was new uh, wood furniture being brought into an office or a lecture hall or even hospital environments, um, this then gets off gassed into the indoor air system. Formaldehyde leads to eye, nose, and throat irritation, coughing, wheezing, chest pains, um, could also prevent, prevent uh, present as systems of similar uh, to bronchite, bronchitis. It's important to take note that sensitive individuals are prone to allergies, uh, people recovering from surgeries, sensitized people for specific chemicals. As we all know, formaldehyde is also a sensitizer. So people tend to, if they've been exposed in the workplace um, or elsewhere unbeknownst to them, they might then be more sensitive if exposed to formaldehyde at a later stage in their life. And the World Health Organization also um, recommends that for people with compromised immunities or people who have been sensitized to formaldehyde to keep the levels at 10 micrograms per cubic meter and not 100 micrograms per cubic meter as um, the national ambient standard says. So this is just if there is immunocompromised individuals within an office or a workplace, um, or people who have been sensitized, then it's important to lower that level. So as a final thought about indoor air quality and sick building syndrome, good clean air leads to improved well-being for employees, better concentration in the workplace. People are less likely to become ill because their immune system doesn't have to fight the irritation the whole time. And in general, it leads to happier people. So what contributes to good, clean, fresh air within workplaces? Uh, filtered fresh air, if there's supplied air. A sufficient supply for the number of occupants. Pollutant-free indoor environments. Regular housekeeping. Maintenance of ventilation systems. Relative humidity that's controlled within the recommended parameters. So you can't just remove your relative humidity, otherwise it gets static and then your electronics are going to do some very strange things. The ability to adjust temperature in order to suit occupant comfort levels, kept within standard recommended ranges based on what type of activities these employees are doing, um, so that if they are producing their own heat from physical labor, then the environment can actually be controlled to be a bit cooler so that they can cool down as well. Or if they are sitting down for long periods of time, such as general office work, your energy levels are normally then a bit lower. You're not producing that much heat because you're not physically moving and the temperature in that environment tends to then need to be a bit higher in order to make people feel more comfortable. So then we've come to our Q&A session. Um, this is now your time. If anyone has any questions to put it in the Q&A tab and let me know so that we can answer any of the questions that might come through. I will give this a few seconds to see if there's any answers coming or questions coming in. All right, so it looks like there's no questions for today during our webinar session. But if there's anything coming up at a later stage, does lighting have an impact? So there's just a question that came in. Um, does lighting have an impact on sick building syndrome? In terms of ventilation, lighting does not have an impact on sick building syndrome, but in terms of with in your general working environment, lighting does play a part in the overall comfort of your employees and productivity as well. So in the broader scheme of things, you could include lighting, 
um, in terms of occupational building health, but in terms of sick building syndrome related to ventilation parameters, lighting would fall into a, its own classification. Um, but poor lighting does lead to fatigue, it does lead to eye strain, um, so lighting in itself also needs to be controlled as many other aspects within a workplace environment. Ventilation surveys are recommended. Um, so in New Zealand, the regulations state that employers have a duty or PCBUs have a duty to provide their employees with a safe and healthy workplace that does not impede their body's ability to be safe and healthy. Um, so if you have poor indoor air quality and it's causing your employees to become ill, uh, it is your duty to make sure that you control that factor. Um, the frequency of it is dependent on if you've controlled it or not. If you haven't controlled it, then it's important that you get surveys out and we assist you in order to get it under control. I hope that answers the, the question. Do having indoor plants in the office reduce sick building syndrome? Um, there are a lot of plants, like for example, the mother-in-law's tongue, which is capable of producing formaldehyde within office spaces. It's also one of the plants that produces the most oxygen relative to the amount of carbon dioxide that it takes in. Um, but it is not very well documented the amount of plants that you need per person within an office environment. So yes, it is good to have plants within your office environment, um, but that is not the sole way in which uh, indoor parameters can be controlled. Because if you also have a large pot and you're not taking very good care of that plant, there's also mold or fungi or bacteria that could be growing, or there's stagnant water that could lead to Legionella growing as well. Another question, what are our steps right now if we want to look at having our factory, or factory offices checked out? Uh, Chem Safety can do this, and all you need to do is send us an email with an inquiry and we will ask you about the size of your facility. Um, we will send you a proposal and we will work with you in order to check um, your ventilation system, what parameters they, is required, how many spaces needs to be assessed. And this is for factory manufacturing facilities, your industrial settings, as well as office settings. So this is, uh, it's all part of a ventilation or indoor air quality system. And we can also do indoor air quality checks, including mold, um, spore trapping, and live culture uh, on the gelatine samples as well. So all you need to do is just send an inquiry and we will then contact you and take it from there as well. What are your recommendations for a chemical storeroom with regards to ventilation? Um, so that would be better uh, directed at our other division, which is the has no section. They are specialists um, in your chemical storage facilities, in compatibility of uh, chemicals, as well as your site inspections and um, certifications. So we can direct you to them. Um, you can also just send the query through to Chrissy and she will send you to Janet and or one of the related consultants specializing in those. All right, so speaking of our other sections and uh, services, Chem Safety can help you in more than just occupational hygiene and more than just ventilation or preventing sick building syndrome. As we have a very broad range of complementary services, uh, taking knowledge from all the different aspects, from asbestos, training providers, hazardous chemical substances, certification, as well as exposure monitoring, site compliance audits, safety data sheet preparation. Our training services include certified handler training, chemical awareness training, site-specific chemical training, asbestos training, um, our oh, asbestos services include asbestos identification analysis and fiber counting. Surveys for asbestos is the collection and identification of asbestos materials, the management evaluating and controlling asbestos risks, and assessing, which includes inspections during and after removal. 
Chem safety is unique across New Zealand with our range of services on offer. It is unmatched by any other provider in the country because what we can provide you is so broad and it is not just for one specific niche within these industries of compliance and risk evaluation. All of our occupational hygiene and hazardous substance services can be handled by us. And one of our specialized consultants will always be able to provide you with either an answer to what your queries are or give you over to one of our uh, colleagues who is a more specialized in a field if we are not capable of handling your question ourselves. Um, we are also capable of assessing many various uh, types of workplace environments, not only offices or manufacturing facilities, but also any kind of foundry, any type of chemical storage, be it um, in piping or in a general chemical storeroom. You can just send us through an email or a query to this address, info at chemosafety.co.nz. And Chrissy will also send a follow-up uh, email later to tomorrow. Um, if there's any other questions, you can just reply to that email that she would be sending through. And in that email, there would also be a few references and links to all of the information that we discussed today. Thank you for your time in attending. And we hope that you have at least find it interesting and maybe even have learned something. Have a great day.